Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are watching and tuning in from around the world. Welcome back to Creation Conversations. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been on the air, mainly due to uh, ministry really taking off in the last couple of weeks and all of us being running around all over the world, um, quite literally. So uh, I arrived back in the UK just a couple of days ago, so I'm still very jet-lagged, so I'll be relying fully on the rest of the team to pick up the slack this evening. Uh, but it's good to be back. We've got another great program as we're discussing bones and fossils and even flies will come into the discussion at some point. But uh, we've uh, got extra cameras set up and it's going to looking to be a really great program. So it's good to be back. Uh, just a reminder, uh, and it's good to see some people who are watching already and it's good to see some people in the chat already. Uh, do send in the live chat comments because we do get to see them all and we do enjoy seeing them all. And remember to ask any questions as we go. Uh, we'll be doing a few little reports as well as some of the new evidence news reports before we have a bit of a break for questions and answers and then our main topic of this evening. So do you get those questions in? It's uh, it's great to, uh, to, to be able to see them all and great to engage with you as you're watching. Anyway, we have the full team with us uh, again this evening. We've got Dr. Glenn Wilson, we've got John Mackay, we've got Diane Eager, we've got Craig Hawkins, and we've got Sam Jenkins. We're all here, we're all back. Let's press on ahead. And so we're going to go around and do some of our ministry reports, as well as some of the reports uh, that we of things that we've been doing in the last little while, some of the research and stuff. So Craig, I'm going to hand straight over to you um, for your report. Let's just get it up on the screen, because I know you've been doing some rather exciting things. Well, there's been lots to do. Um, the museum's really coming on with a few new displays, and here's one that we've done. Uh, the polished straight tree model. I think I've, I've reported before that I've been in the midst of doing it, but uh, here's the finished version. So we've got a colified tree or a replica of it at least uh, going up through various strata. It's made out of fiberglass. Got real coal down the bottom, uh, based on your suggestion, Joe. Um, but yeah, we went, went around to a local coal mine and got some coal and. Uh, We've got a few fossils in there so that's telling the story of polished straight trees which regular viewers will be very familiar with of the show um been doing a few other things as well i've finally established another display cabinet of after their kind um so you've got a great fossil crab and the seahorses in there as well and briars owens and various shells and sort those sorts of things so that that's good to have up as well um, I think I might have shown this the physical version of this a few the last show that we did together, well, uh, which is a coelacanth sculpture. It's actually not a, a an exact cast, but it's a sculpture based on 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 the original fossil, and that'll just be another sort of after their kind. Given that the coelacanth was a an early indicator apparently of evolution uh, from fish to land animals which is obviously false so that's another great addition um i don't, don't know if joe or john want to comment on this one but this is when we went to the coal mine we found this great piece of layered coal it's quite a big piece actually mm -hmm. but some very sharp boundaries there yeah, on the I, um I, i'll comment on that for you great because i've been to that coal mine and uh we've got some great fossils there but the thing that is characteristic of all coal mines basically all around the planet, except for the brown coal ones. The black coal ones are really noticeably layered, uh, just like you find the strata on either side there. You've got grey shale above and below, and that's layered. Uh, but the coal itself, so the plants in the, the coal that form the coal in material don't just live there, grow there, fall into the swamp as they die and get covered up. Um, we can chat with uh, Dr. Glenn Wilson later because he's walked through the Everglades like I have. And in present day swamps, you do not find, first of all, an even bottom, but you usually don't find any of the plants building up even in the Everglades because they will build up in the summertime, but uh, uh, just then, then rot and decompose uh, throughout the rest of the year. So you'll find if you want to explain layered strata of carbon rich material you have to wash the plants in as well which is why you have real trouble trying to find the proof that they grew there 
you know, the ecology that's preserved with the worms and, uh, and with the roots and all of that, it's just lacking from the major black coal seams all around the planet. And in the brown coal seams, uh, yes, we've done a few programs on coal. The brown coal seams are flood deposits of logs and bits of wood. They just haven't been totally carbonized yet. They are fermented wood. And I really mean fermented. So you find lots of wood alcohol there um, and it will explode if you don't have your uh, exhaust in your car, uh, particularly uh, muffled against sparks and things like that. So that's great coal, um, Craig, and great for your displays on uh, formation of washed in materials to make coal. Yeah, and going back to that. the, um, so I was just saying, going back to the polystrate trees, it's something that John can comment on as well, but having experienced polystrate trees in the States, in the UK, in Australia, the one thing that I noticed pretty much straight away is that they all tend to sit on a bed of coal um, and the tree them itself its bark tends to be coalified yet it's running up through layers and layers of rock which has very little coal in it um, or has very little thin seams of coal running through it so it's something that um, is very characteristic of the polystrate trees which are predominantly found in the carboniferous rocks that's the pennsylvanian and the mississippian and sometimes they're found uh, in the sort of uh, permo triassic rocks as well like the ones in australia but you'll often find that they are sitting in this bed of coal you'll find fabulous fossils in the coal but the one thing you won't find is any kind of indication that these trees grew there because there's no soil if they're pine trees as your one is there's no pine needles if it's a lycopod there's no root uh, sometimes you'll get a root bulb but there's no indication that roots have actually gone into the soil or into the swamp or any kind of material that the tree has been growing into they've been ripped up they've been stripped of their branches they've been stripped of most of their roots uh, sometimes their bark is coalified and then this upright position so it's uh, looking like a pretty good model that you've got there right thank you okay next one uh, picked up this um fossil which we've put in yesterday, a great ammonite, nice big one, very heavy to lift, and that mm, looks great well, at lovely. the base of the uh, the alligator cabinet we've got there that basically pointing to the world was once different and um, the present is not the key to the past, of course, has been a theme that we run at Creation Research quite a bit. So there's Rob, one of our volunteers, who's uh, holding that. And I think this is our last one just to show. We've put up our little Archaeopteryx cast up in our display where we're talking about feathered dinosaurs. So, and of course, it isn't a feathered dinosaur. It's a bird. Um, and that's it. That's what we've... Oh, actually, no, there's a couple more. That's right. Uh, we When we were out doing the coal, um, that's a brachidium, which is the... Uh, it's a mechanism inside the, the muscle or the, or the valve of, of a brachiopod, uh, very well preserved. It's a real chance hit, but we, um, to, to, to break it like that and to have it preserved like that. Uh, but we found a number of them uh, on the trip, which was great. They're apparently used for helping to open up the shell, but uh, I could be corrected on that, but, um, yeah, some great, great ones there preserved. Craig, it's like a natural version of a spring, and mm. it's exactly what it's used for. Uh, so well done finding that by opening mm. it up. They are more common than most people think, but people don't actually um, usually find them like that. They smash them before they get to them. I'll just make one comment on Archaeopteryx because we're preparing a big history of dinosaurs in our museum. Archaeopteryx was first classified by Sir Richard Owen as a bird, right? When it was found in the 1860s, Richard Owen, the man who invented the word dinosaur, was emphatic, this was a bird. And uh, if you get close up, you'll see it's a drowned bird. So more on that later on. That's it from me. Great stuff. 
Um, thank you for that there, Craig. All right, Glenn, why don't we have a bit of an, uh, an update and let people know what's been going on with us because uh, I've been in the USA for the last two months, flew home just a couple of days ago, and I'll be back out again later on this year. So the first thing to let people know is that, uh, well, thank you to all of those who came and saw me. Thank you to all of those who uh, invited me along to come and speak. Thank you to all of those who've supported us along the way. And if you're in the United States and you would like to uh, have Creation Research come and speak at your church or your event, or you'd like to organize a field trip or so on and so forth, uh, Glenn is currently the man to get in touch with uh, as our ministry coordinator in the United States. And we have a brand new website, which is up yes. and running in the United States. Glenn, do you want to let people know how they can find that? You can go to creationresearchusa.org, O-R-G, not the .net for the no. uh, one that would lead you to John. And So go to creationresearchusa.org, and you can find a link for ministries. I'm trying to sign Joe up. We're looking at him coming in October through the middle of uh, November of this year. Okay, so we're already starting to make plans on how to keep him running from one church to the other and fossil hunts in between. It sounds good. Now, we did quite a lot of stuff while we were in the States this time. Yes. Um, a lot of it was the administration and the sorting out of all the fossils and everything else. But we also went back and spent some time with our good friend David Reeves, who will, uh, Lord willing, will want to get him on the show at some point fairly soon. He's got a fabulous new building. Uh, amazing mm. way the Lord has blessed his ministry to be able to uh, get this building. It's basically a ready-made museum and planetarium. Absolutely fantastic. Um, but low on the fossils well that's all right because we're working with him and we've uh, managed to get him some of the fossils but the other thing which david does very very well other than his museum ministry yeah. uh, is also the media side of things he's got a fabulous studio set up uh, podcast mm -hmm. studio live stream studio enormous uh, recording studio as well and uh, four years ago when I first ever got taken to the United States by uh, uh, John Mackay, um, we actually did some recordings uh, with him there. We filmed another six this time, and they'll be available in the next few months. But we actually now have these three recordings, these three DVDs, brand new DVDs available in the UK and in the States. Uh, these will be available in the UK from tomorrow on our UK website, or you can order them from the David Reeves Superstore, the Creation Superstore. We've got One Deadly Bite, uh, which is talking about snakes and venom and whether a good God would create snakes and venom. Uh, we've got Design the Final Proof, which is where it deals with things like, hey, what are those little mushroomy type things? Um, and what kind of evidence do they show? And we've got the Fast Flood Fossils program, which is really about my research that I did as part of my undergraduate degree at Hans Stanton. So all three of them are now available uh, on our UK website and from the Creation Superstore. And Lord willing, they'll be available from the rest of the Creation Research stores very shortly. But they're all brand new. They all feature me. Uh, and there are uh, three really great programs. And there'll be six more coming out uh, in the next little while, which we'll keep you updated about. Um, a few other things. Glenn, has I missed anything? I, from you, what were, in the you were talking about David's studio, recording studio. We made recordings in my recording studio. That is true, <laughs> That's yes. a little different. That's my bedroom. Also known as your bedroom. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yes. But I did make use of Joe's time there and made some recordings for the radio spot. Uh, so that was productive as well. And you spoke quite a bit at churches and um, every morning on the radio. Yep, we did uh, a whole week of radio programs. We uh, we did some great programs. And some of these program teaching programs will be available up on our uh, YouTube channel in the next few days, um, including a great new sermon, which we uh, which we taught. So do go and check that out. Um Another thing, which let's just talk about one or two little fossily things, which we um, came up with in the last, uh, or have got brand new in the museum project. The first one, let's see if this works, if I put this up on the screen now. There it is there. Now, we were just uh, talking about, this. this is the live stream, by the way, um, just uh, next to me here. So we've got a second camera set up. Uh, can you see this fabulous fossil? Um, it's actually, well, you can see you've got the... Uh, the bone here, the jawbone, 
And then up this end, you can see the tooth. It's a strangely shaped tooth. Uh, it's actually a shark tooth um, known as an Estestus adestus shark tooth. And uh, the Adestus shark is, is strange. It's got a big sort of curly whirly kind of jaw we're not entirely sure how it kind of works or functions but we know it's a shark for sure and we also know exactly where we got this from uh, in fact john i remember talking to you a few months back about wanting to get hold of some of these because they are uh, so important where do these come from john okay i first heard about this deposit uh, when i was in northern tennessee and it's just over the border in the coal pennsylvania coal seams in kentucky which have since been discovered uh, to have quite a lot of shark material in it. And, of course, the uh, but shark is characteristic of having no real solid bones, except many of the parts of the sharks in the Kentucky coal seams are preserved really well. They've been buried really quickly, just like the plants that washed in. And, of course, I heard about them. And when Joe rang me up and said, can we get one, can we get one? Um, uh, who am I to say no to Joe when he pleads like that? So, Joe, congratulations for having got this. And uh, did you just bring that back from the USA? It's from the USA, but it was actually shipped here several months ago when uh, we first got it off of the collector who found it. And you can see it's uh, it's quite a nice detailed shark tooth. If we get up, let's see if we can get it up nice and close nice. and get some uh, good detail on there. Let's see if we can zoom in. No, it's not wanting to focus now. Never mind. There we go. So, yeah, you can see it's got some really nice detail on there. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice jawbone uh, with some really nice detail. And it's a great piece of evidence of not only a, a rapid um, formation of coal, but also a catastrophic creation of coal. This isn't a slow, shallow swamp that slowly builds up over vast periods of time. So there's a, a really nice... Uh, example just there and we'll be bringing that camera back in a in a little while because we've got plenty of other fossils which we're going to uh, show as well but i just want to show i know it's not as impressive as yours john but this was another donation that came through just a little while ago there we go yes great big trilobite plate yeah mine's mine's bigger than that <laughs> i know yes. you wouldn't be able to pick <laughs> yours up i know that but we're, we're, we are limited in size and space here. Yeah. We're not as big as Australia, so we have to go for the slightly smaller yeah. ones. But it is a pretty beautiful uh, example of a whole load of um, Canberra Palace trilobites. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no, that's great. nice catastrophic deposit as well. Anyway, that's uh, that's us again. A reminder: get in touch with Glenn or myself or any Creation Research office. Really, if you want to book a Creation Research. Uh, ministry in the United States and um, we will be back there in October and November basically from the beginning of October and we'll go home before Thanksgiving okay Joe so, before uh, you finish now that you're back uh, Susie's doing well um, your museum what's the opening arrangements now in the UK so in the UK, we're still continuing on uh, with a Wednesday and a Saturday open, but please do continue to keep us in prayer for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, we want to get the museum open more regularly. The only way we can really do that is if two things happen. The first thing is this year, we need to get the museum self-guiding. Now, this requires two main things. I know they all keep coming in twos, but that's the way that it is. The two main things that it requires is number one, to be able to get extra finance to be able to set everything up in display cases and uh, you know prepared basically to go on display and secondly we need people who are willing to do graphic design and people who are willing to help fund get the signs up get the murals up and also make a self-guiding tour that goes around based on scanning uh, special codes and stuff which bring it up on your phone which lead you around in a kind of a tour way um, so we really need to get the museum set up and running secondly we also need to get a curator for the museum ideally somebody who knows a bit of science or theology uh, has a sort of a, an all-rounded kind of idea of uh, of how to run a museum and sort of the knowledge so that they can keep an eye on what things are going on here and look after the place and help to keep the place open while I'm personally off traveling and teaching. So we do need some uh, some extra helpers, some extra volunteers. So get in touch if you feel like that might be you and we can pray about it together. But we 
do need to have extra volunteers to help us get the place self running and extra, um, particularly one curator who can help to maintain the whole of this, uh, this museum. Um, so those are the really two big things. But at the moment, Wednesdays and Saturdays are how we're continuing forward. However, if you would like to get a private tour around the museum, you can book outside of those. You just need to get in touch. There's a booking form on our website uh, or you can just email us info at creationresearchuk.com and the team will get in touch with you and we'll let you know when you can come and book a private tour so Wednesdays and Saturdays are the days if you want to come outside of those days get in touch with us and you can book a tour to go around the museum until then we're just going to keep on pushing forwards uh, in trying to get the place set up and organized ready for it being a self-guided tour around the museum all right, uh, we better move on then to um, John and Diane for their ministry reports and discussions before we move into um, the main topic. But I think that Diane has also got some presentations to share and perhaps we'll have a bit of a question answer break uh, when we come to the end of that. So do make sure you keep your questions mm. coming in. But John, over to and you. In fact, if you don't mind me asking Craig to join us as well, um, because we, we're all getting together at the end of July and you Aussies, particularly if you live in southeast Queensland, remember 29th and 30th, we are having our big new open day for our new Creation Discovery Centre. So come along and see me and Craig and Diane. A wonderful weekend. And you can actually see this as well. Now, I've asked Joe before publicly on, on camera what this is. So, Joe, remind us again. Uh, let's put you up to full screen so we can all see you. There we go. Uh, it's a very famous fossil. Um, it's one of the first dinosaur fossils to have been officially recognized as a dinosaur fossil. It is the iguanodon tooth found from near Oxfordshire, um, found by, well, originally it was Mary Ann Mantell who actually found it, but later in life it was her husband who really took the credit for it. Um, but uh, Gideon Mantell is the name. Okay, thank you for that. Because, you see, I, I am a bit of a hoarder, uh, as Joe knows and now Glenn knows, because I've hoarded fossils from around the planet on every continent of the globe, just about, except Antarctica. And I have fossils from down there, as well as Iraq in the Middle East and, and all of the wars where soldiers have collected things for me. But this one here is one of the first casts I got from the UK by a man who later would have been uh, received his letters from the Queen for the service he'd done to paleontology. Now, I picked this up because it is what Joe said. And in our museum, which is having a display called Dinosaurs, the Monsters God Made, which is exactly what Sir Richard Owen, the man who invented the word dinosaur, the man who classified Archaeopteryx as a bird way back in the 1860s, uh, that's what he called dinosaurs, the monsters God made. He was sure that God had created these big things. Now, he didn't know where to fit them because he only had a couple of skeleton pieces and all of that. But one of the ones that he had, tragically, ended up being this, Gideon Mantell's uh, piece of bone, which tragically you can see even scientists are subject to the moral fall and decay um, of this planet. Joe's right. Uh, the history books record that while Gideon Mantell, a doctor, uh, was actually inside visiting a patient, his wife was pa pacing around in the street outside and picked up one of the paving stones with this tooth in it. Now, later research showed it came from a, a little bit further south outside the town of Cookville, uh, in, uh, in south of London, really. And uh, Gideon Mantell tracked down the paving stone and later dug up some rather famous bones down there. But in his first book, in his first work about monsters, because this is before the word dinosaur was invented, this is 1822. And the word dinosaur is not invented for another, basically, 1841. That's quite a, quite a distance. In his day, monsters, dragons. That was the word that was commonly used. So we'll be pointing out the fact that historically dragons as a word provably existed for dinosaurs before Sir Richard Owen invented it and provably was used by Sir Richard Owen and others for the dinosaurs after. I mean, even in their official literature. 
But Gideon Mantell's wife, Mary Anning, of actually, she was already famous for collecting fossils uh, along the south coast of England. Uh, you've been down to the Jurassic Coast, Joseph? I have indeed, yes. Uh, what have you found along that Jurassic Coast? There. Oh, deep sea creatures like ammonites and mm -hmm. deep sea creatures like the big ichthyosaurs and they're buried next to great dinosaurs like the Skeletosaurus and yeah, and I giant found, trees. I found a plesiosaur along there one day and it's yeah. right alongside the shells and things like that. And Mary yeah. Annie's plesiosaurs are still on display uh, in, in the museums and they're labelled sea dragons. So you can prove it historically. The little word dragon is written on the display. Dragon was the word before 1841 and dragon was the word after 1841. But here's the personal tragedy. And when you're reading your science, remember scientists aren't sort of the ultra elite in morality or that. Scientists come in two varieties, male and female, and they're all born sinners. Horribly humbling, but it happens to be true. Mary Anning is credited in her husband's work as finding this, uh, the first dinosaur fragment uh, that was recognized uh, by Richard Owen and others, the first monster that gave rise to Gideon Mantell's theory about a world full of monsters previously, because he said, this is a lizard tooth, but a far bigger lizard than anything we've seen before. Uh, and a lot of people mocked him for that, but not Sir Richard Owen, not some of the others who'd already seen uh, big monsters, big fragments of teeth in the Oxford Museum or things like that, and, and pondered about it themselves. You know the tragedy? They ended up divorced. Mary and Dr. Gideon ended up divorced. And it's only after their divorce that Gideon Mantell re recredits himself as being the finder of this. So just thought I'd like to add that bit in. Uh, you need to give credit where credit is due. And all the evidence indicates that it's Mary who found the first dinosaur fragment. She was already famous for finding plesiosaurs along the south coast of England, the Jurassic Coast. And so it's uh, much more credible to fit her in history in the right place as the dinosaur girl who gets no credit. OK, so we are setting up a big display in our museums, Dinosaurs the Monsters God Made, subtitled The Lies They Tell About Dinosaurs. So on the 29th and the 30th, come along and see. Archaeopteryx, always a bird. Archaeopteryx was related to another fossil that Huxley said this gave rise to the birds. Well, come along and see the lies exposed. Well, one other thing, Craig, while you're on screen, bring us all up now, me and Diane and Craig, because... Craig, you don't need to tell us too much about this because it's going to come up a bit later in the show. But I have this because of you. Um, can you tell us how you ended up with this strange looking skull? Craig? Uh, Craig, you're on mute. I think you're Sorry, I did put myself on mute. Uh, yeah, so I've been searching around on online auction sites and came across these guys. Um, it's an Australopithecus. It's not not the Lucy variety. It's uh, Boise, I think, um, that yeah. one. And, okay. Uh, so yeah. So how come, how come I've got it? Well, it's about eighty dollars cheaper to post it to you than to post it to me in Tasmania. <laughs> so I've got it because you're a cheapskate, and you're coming up here at the end of the month, and you'll pick it up and put it in your hand luggage. So it's Dil diligent, diligent with money, I think we we call it there, John. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So I, I accept that correction. That's very well, good. Well, I don't know what the uh, security people will think when I'm taking that through the uh, security <laughs> because when I took the Triceratops head, uh, the lady uh, was exclaiming, he's got a rhino head in his bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best one I ever had was from a, a Qantas um, collector or a, a serv supervisor, as he took me aside and in his very polite English accent at Heathrow said, Sir, do you realise you have a bag full of bones? Um, yeah, so you get some very interesting reactions here. So I'll be interested to see what reaction you get when you take a couple of these skulls back. Meanwhile, we'll put all of these on display in our human history room because in Australia we've got a big controversy going on 
black versus white, yes versus no, the voice for Aboriginals uh, as opposed to Europeans, etc. And all of this room at the 29th and 30th will be dedicated to that. And in fact, quite a bit of the subject matter tonight deals with human skulls, non-human skulls. And in fact, Adine, you're, you're coming up as well on the 29th and 30th, correct? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. And you'll be available to, I mean, as a qualified <laughs> medical person, you'll be available to hang around that deadhead room and talk about which are human and which aren't, correct? Yes, yes. We've got really interesting things for people to see and talk about. And uh, just don't re don't forget, particularly you, Joe, that we will be filming Diane and we'll have a good cameraman. And if people think your videos walking around the museum with Diane have been great, you wait till you see ours with Craig and Diane. Oh, they, yes. <laughs> humble, humble pie, hey? Yeah, but this, that's what's coming up, folks. So if you haven't yet signed up uh, for the Saturday, Sunday, 29th, 30th of July, it's going to be a fabulous afternoon of both revealing the lies we're being sold and revealing the truth we should be told. So that's the 29th and 30th. And all of these issues matters because one of the things you do find is the theory of evolution is not being promoted because of the evidence. It's been promoted because people wanted to destroy the validity, the truth, the history of God's word and undermine God's reputation in people's eyes. Now, you haven't undermined God's real reputation. That stands firm. But you've undermined people's confidence in the God of the Bible from Genesis chapter 1, where he made the whole lot. He has rights over the whole lot. He's the owner of the whole lot. And you and I need to bow before his authority as the maker of men and the maker of apes as well. So that's coming up a little bit later. But Diane, just to hand over to you now, um, you've got some evidence news updates you want to bring us. So go ahead. Yes, <clears throat> we sent out one of our email newsletters this week and a couple of uh, interesting stories. If we can go to my slides, um, that's that's good. Yes. Um, we have uh, two quite uh, different uh, topics. One is about a mind-blowing fossil insect and the other is about uh, two people named Flannery and Darwin. That's... Uh, that's not a comedy duo. Uh, we'll get to uh, get to them in a moment. Uh, but first of all, we have uh, a story about a fossil insect. Uh, it was actually a fossil Katie did. Uh, now, for people who are not familiar with this, it's a, a fossil that's a bit like a um, or an insect that's a bit like a grasshopper. There are plenty of them uh, still living. Uh, but this was found in the Green River Formation, which is a very famous fossil formation, and both John and Joseph have been there, so we'll uh, have a look at some uh, real examples fr from there. And it's dated as being around um, 50 million years old. And the important thing about this particular fossil is that the internal organs were very, very clearly preserved. This was very, very well preserved. And you could see the thoracic muscles, um, you could see its intestines, you could see a, a part of its digestive system called a ventriculus. Um, and uh, most intriguingly, uh, on the, uh, in the opinions of one of the scientists who uh, studied it, was that uh, you could see its testes and uh, accessory glands. So incredibly good preservation. Uh, so much so that the one of the scientists who worked on this uh, made this comment that the testis, the accessory glands and the ventriculus were all the same as in present day Katie did. Now note that um, I was just blown away by it. To my knowledge, this is the first example of this level of preservation um, well, that's interesting that he should say that because people who have been exploring the Green River for a while have noticed this for quite a long time. It's not new. But uh, let's go back to um, being blown away that it was the same as present day Katie did. Well, that's not a problem for us. We're not blown away uh, that uh, its internal structures were the same as present day Katie did because we have been told very clearly in Genesis 1 that uh, 
insects, all animals, all living things were made according to their kinds and they have reproduced after their kinds ever since. So what he is expressing, what this scientist is expressing now is simply, well, here's the evidence. But uh, they insist that what they've found is evidence for evolution when it in fact is the opposite. So you can stand your ground on uh, what, the, what the Bible says. Um, and every now and again, or quite often actually, uh, the scientists just admit this even though they don't understand what they're admitting. So don't be afraid to stand your ground on the scriptures. Uh, the evidence uh, fits it. Um, now, the other uh, issue, of course, is that uh, how did it get to be so well preserved? Now, the usual story by uniform geolo uniformitarian geologists um, is this little summary, which was in the press release from the uh, University of Illinois and was then reproduced in a number of uh, science news sources. And we give you the links to these if you want to go back and check them out. And this is the story they told. 50 million years ago in what is now a northwestern Colorado, a katydid died, sank to the bottom of the lake and was quickly buried in fine sediment where it remained until its compressed fossil was recovered in recent years. Now, if you ask any pool owner what happens to dead insects that might get blown into their pool, um, and, uh, well, dead insects actually float on water, so I'm not quite sure that that story really fits. And also, if we go and look at this particular formation, it's a very, very famous uh, fossil formation. And one of the distinctive things about it is that it has many, many fine layers. And if we just come back to us, uh, John and Joseph has got some lovely fossils um, that illustrate the uh, how silly that story is about fossil insects and also about the Green River. So let's have a look at those, if we can come back to us now. Okay, let me go first and I'll hand back to Joe. Uh, introducing this, you can all see our fossil fish. Now, this is what the Green River Formation is most known for, and Joe will take that up in a little while. Now, um, many of the fossils are touched up. This has been superficially painted over because many of the fossils seem to have lost their colour if they're near the surface. Uh, Joe will show you the edge of his a bit later, which is a much thicker slice. But this comes from the 18-inch band. Now, when I say 18-inch band, half a metre if you're in metric countries, uh, but it's full of, full of layers, 40,000, I believe. And so the argument is it takes you one, one year to get two bands dark light, dark light, etc., And so this represents a vast amount of time. But it's full of these fishes, some small, some large. And this, by the way, is a member of the herring family. Herrings are still here. So like Katie did, herrings don't either. They just continue to produce their own kind. They don't evolve. But Diane's article is more about things like this. See the insect? Now, I was asked one year, could we supply a, a guy who was a lecturer in insectology, I don't know what the correct word is, uh, with fossil insects, and he wanted all varieties. And so we did manage to get them for him. And that's what you find is amazing. The level, that's about as close as I can get to keep it in focus there. The level of preservation, and these are not touched up, by the way. That's exactly how you find them because there are commercial quarries there we can go in and dig up your own, right? There's millions of them yes. really per square kilometre, insects, fishes, plants, you name it. And the preservation, uh, I know the article says this is the first time he's heard of it. Well, that just means he hasn't been listening too carefully. We have fossils like that from all over the planet of all ages. And if you think that it's actually 50 million years old at the Green River, then what you have to objectively say is for 50 million years, Katie dids haven't evolved. I mean, 50 million years of not evolving is good evidence it's not ever going to. 50 million years, <laughs> herrings turning into herrings. In fact, Joe, would you take up this and show them your fish? Now, you, I'll credit you, your fish is bigger than my fish. So, so take it away. 
<laughs> yeah, well, this is a um, uh, well, it was formerly known as um, Prisca Cara, but it's now known as um, something else like Coca uh, Cocorelites, I believe, um, which is this beautiful fish from the Green River Formation here. Uh, and this is in its natural state. It, again, it hasn't been uh, painted up, it hasn't been trimmed up. It is a high quality fish. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch across to our other camera here uh, and see, Sam, I'll let you uh, switch that across if that's okay. Oh, there's, there's the skull, lovely. Right, let's bring it over here because we've actually set up um, two cameras. And by the way, we're trying out some different ideas with the, uh, the camera setups now so that we can bring close-up shots and different close-up shots of different fossils. We'll be talking about that one later. But there's the uh, fossil fish just there. Uh, as you can see it. Now, the reason why we wanted to uh, to bring this is because actually we're interested in this, well, it's quite a large, thick slice here. So let's bend it up like that. And hey, can you see all of the valves, um, the different layers that you can see there? Let's see if we can zoom in even closer to get a really, really good shot here. So there you go, John, there's all the layers. Can you show us in the fact, bit with those brown blobs in and talk about them? That's what I'm going to do. So we're moving across. Oh, there's a brown blob there. And if we keep going along, you can see there's actually a, a fish uh, in, still inside the layers just here. You can see how it kind of goes along like that. Um, but we've got these brown kind of blobs in here. Um, there's another some around here. Let's go to this side. There we go. There's one just there. Um, you see all the layers and you see the blobs and how it's, well, it's 3D. It's definitely sitting in there because can you see how all the layers are kind of uh, moving around it? In fact, Joe, isn't that petrified poo? It is indeed. Absolutely. So, Joe, so, I'd like to add, my wife and I have been there. We've been to the quarries and that's what you look for. You pull off a slab and you look for these dark layers there and that's where you split the rock to find your fish and we found Absolutely. over a hundred, yeah. all the smaller ones, like John was showing the herrings, all perfectly yeah. presented. Some more there, look. So, what's the significance of one. finding fossil poo? It's really important. well. Firstly, if you've ever seen any kind of fish poo, um, it kind of comes out and. Well, it kind of dissipates quite quickly. It doesn't kind of hang around and and uh, and 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 sink to the bottom. But anything that does make it to the bottom just decomposes very very quickly. If you're actually going to get fecal matter actually caught up into the rock layers and buried, particularly if you're going to get a fish buried uh, in the same kind of area you're going to need a very quick and rapid burial indeed we're not talking about slow gradual burial the idea of the valve is that it's one valve per season which is two valves a year which well you see just how many layers and layers there are there there's many 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 we're talking vast ages just in this little slab here and um, so really there's no indication of slow gradual oxygenless environment we're talking about a fast burial of all of these creatures and the poo and everything else inside of it for sure and, and it's always a mixed bed because when we found our fish we also found all sorts of terrestrial plants flowers and you found a katydid as well oh for sure mm. okay diane do you want to continue on with tim flannery yes indeed Yes, the other item we had in the newsletter was about uh, two people named uh, Flannery and Darwin. Um, who wouldn't have known one another because Tim Flannery lives in Australia now and Darwin uh, lived in England and died a long time ago. Uh, however, there is a connection. Uh, this was something that Craig actually alerted us to. Uh, he uh, sent us some quotes from a book that was written by Tim Flannery. If you've never heard of Tim Flannery, he's a well-known environmentalist and also a campaigner on uh, climate change. And he was uh, honoured um, back in 2007 uh, uh, as being Australian of the Year because of his, um, his work in campaigning about the environment and about uh, climate change. 
Uh, anyway, he made this comment about natural selection in this book. Uh, natural selection, Darwin understood from his studies, is an unspeakably cruel and amoral process. He came to realise that he must eventually tell the world that we are spawned not from godly love, but from evolutionary barbarity. Uh, and he's not, uh, uh, Tim Flannery is not uh, doing Darwin an injustice here. In fact, that is the very thing that Darwin did actually conclude from uh, about. And if you go back to Darwin's uh, own autobiography, he writes in uh, rather verbose language, um, but it is worth looking through this. Uh, this is what he wrote, a being so powerful and so full of knowledge as a God who could create the universe is to our finite minds omnipotent, meaning all powerful, omnis omniscient, meaning all knowing. And it revolts our understanding to suppose his benevolence, that is his goodness, is not unbounded. So God is uh, supposedly all good. For what advantage can there be in the sufferings of millions of lower animals throughout endless time? Because if uh, you believe in the theory of evolution, the life forms that we have on earth today, including ourselves, are the end result of a process that has gone through millions of years involving millions of um, generations of death, disease and suffering. And in fact, his Jarwin's famous book, of course, The Origin of Species, um, has the term the struggle for life in its longer title. Uh, and eventually, uh, Darwin went from believing in God to he never became an atheist, but he did at the end of his life uh, deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. And this is important for people who say that, well, creation is not a gospel issue. They should take notice of what happened to Darwin. And this was his response to a, a question that was uh, sent to him by letter. I'm sorry I have to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as divine revelation and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Well, how tragic is that, considering that Darwin in his early life originally graduated in theology, so he did actually know the Bible, but by the end of his life he was actually denying it. Um, now, if you want to know uh, a little bit more about how uh, that happened throughout Darwin's life, we have written an article called uh, The Descent of a Man. You can download that as a PDF from our fact file. Um, if you just put Descent of Man in, uh, in the uh, search, search box there, uh, it will come up as one of the options. And uh, that's a useful article for looking at the history of how when someone comes to start off doubt the authority of scripture where they end up and it's quite a tragic story for someone who started off um so bright and so um well um well set up in life uh, if you want to get our newsletter it is free it's an email that comes out every few weeks and you can sign up for it from on our um on our website, just go to our main website and there's a link there that just says newsletters. Uh, now, if we can come back to us now, um, we've got some uh, interesting things to, to show you because these uh, skulls that we've acquired or we've been acquiring for a while, but we've just had added to our collection um, and setting up this display for the uh, for the museum in Brisbane, we thought we'd have a look at the whole issue of supposed human evolution, uh, because a lot of Christians have been drawn into this, and they think, oh, the evidence for human evolution is overwhelming. Uh, well, in fact, when you look at the actual evidence, uh, it's not quite so overwhelming. And again, we need to stand our ground on what the scriptures actually say. So, um, John, I think you've got some of our collection there with you. Um, I certainly have got ahead of everybody else today. Uh, so just to give them a tempter, because mm. it's probably time we had a break soon, Sam, said yes, thank you. Indeed. I'm just mm. going to bring up this one, Diane, and test you. Uh, this is one 
that was found in Java just a little bit. That's all that was found there. And he became fairly famous in the early days. If he came from Java, what name do you think they gave him? Well, this was the original Java man. Yes. So yeah. this is one of the first yeah. one that ended history as evidence of our ape-like ancestry. But more of that after the break. So, Joe, yeah. you and Sam share yeah. the sort of uh, um, thank yous and things like that. Sam, over to you for well, and any questions. I'm just, I'm just going to show one last quick fossil, which is sort of related to what... Um, uh, we were talking about uh, a second ago because it relates to, um, and I know you, you asked me to uh, to get this as well. Um, those of you who've been watching Creation Conversations will know that we had a um, special um, dragonfly fossil, which we are looking after in the States at the moment for Craig Hawkins. Uh, but Sam, if you want to switch on the other close-up camera for a second, you'll see that we've also got our own uh, fossil dragonfly here in the UK. There you are. You can see it up on the screen at the moment. Now, this is the one from China. Um, so it's uh, it's one that we acquired in the United States and brought back here to the UK, which is uh, wonderful. And you can get some, well, you can get some, some interesting fakeries from China, but uh, this happens to be one of the real ones. Mm. Um, and you can see you've got that beautiful dragonfly with all of that detail. You can see all the detail on the wings there. Mm. So again, it's a living fossil. It's a very fragile fossil as well, being from a dragonfly. So it's definitely not taken, uh, <laughs> well, more than you know, few days to really be trapped and fossilized. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any kind of a fossil uh, dragonfly at all. But if we move it along, look what it's buried next to. Ah, oh, you see the uh, fish fossil? Well, there's actually about three or four fish fossils uh, on this slab, and there's a couple around the back of it as well. But if we go down slightly further, you'll start to see that there's plant material. And if we kind of zoom up a little bit into some of the plant material, you can start to see there's some uh, little thorns that show up on there as well. It's just gone a little bit out of focus. There we go. Um, hopefully you can see that there. There's some little thorny things starting to stick out. So interesting mm. slab of, uh, of fossil for sure. Beautiful fish fossil. Beautiful dragonfly fossil as well. Uh, and so it's just one of the many amazing fossils that we've ended up with here in the UK and in all of our museum collections around the world. But anyway, Sam, back over to you for some questions and answers. Well, Yarmy Hearties, welcome to Skull and Crossbones. I've been waiting ages to do that voice. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> um, right, okay, so we'll uh, jump in to uh, some thank yous to the question. Uh, so we've got... Uh, Lynn Colson coming in with 40 New Zealand buckaroos. God bless you. Thank you so much for that. It's very much appreciated. And uh, we have a question here uh, that comes in from Shogiwa, who says, how do you know it's poo and not a clump of dirt? It's a good question. Well, shall I answer it? Yeah, you go ahead. Well, that's the know, idea of I'm question and answers, Joe. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, it's the same way that you know that dinosaur poo is dinosaur poo. You'll often find that many of these fossils, particularly these fish fossils, are so well preserved that they still have stomach content inside of them, right? Inside their stomach. Um, and sometimes you'll find that they are actually spewing stomach content out of their mouths. John has a fabulous vomiting fish in his collection. And so you'll find mummified dinosaurs that have then been fossilized and they've still got gut content and so on and so forth. Now, gut content is very distinctive. It's very different to uh, random clumps of dirt. It's basically partially digested food. So whenever you find a fossil which has got digested or partially digested gut content in its gut, if you ever find that content outside of the gut, uh, you'll know where it's come from. <laughs> so you'll find that coprolite, which is the posh word, fossilized poo, is very distinctive if you know what you're looking for and you can distinguish a lump of coprolite uh, from, you know, you're walking down, say, Lyme Regis, famous Jurassic coast, where you find ichthyosaur and shark coprolite. You're in a beach which is covered in stones, but provided you know what to look for, you can distinguish the coprolite from the millions of other stones that are on the beach because it is very distinctive. We know that it's coprolite because we find it inside the skeletons of these creatures that are fossilized. And so if you ever find that outside of the skeletons, you know where it's come from. Um, that's basically the, the answer in a, in a nutshell. Any okay. questions, comments from you, John? Yeah. Um, having been the supervisor of a, a set of little aquariums 
in a um, lab, um, school lab, which I set up for several years, there's several things you become very interested in, and that is what happens to the fish poo uh, when it drops out. Um, well, I've actually seen fish that are just about to defecate and the other fish are lining up behind to swallow it. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like a vending machine. Uh, so they will actually eat it as it's, it's coming out. If you think that's vile, there are many creatures that eat the poo of their, their cousins, rabbits in particular, not only mark their grounds with poo, but they'll actually go back and eat it. Uh, it it's actually one way of recycling um, bacteria in their stomach. But if you see poo that gets onto the floor, then as Joe will tell you from his discoveries and his observations, that there are many fungi um, and, and uh, all of these sort of things that actually inhabit the floor of the, the sea or the freshwater lake that have a key factor in cleaning up the floor of poo and things like that. If you have a look at the thick sheets that Joe showed us before, if you count the number of valves over the piece of poo, some of those valves you would say took 20 years to be buried. Now that's just not gonna happen in reality. The reason they're actually there is they were preserved so rapidly and you need to know that because so many of the well-meaning Christians who say, well, we've got to allow the scientists to have his millions of years because look, one dark valve, one light valve, and that's one year. No, if that was one year, then that piece of poo took 10 years to be buried and that's simply not going to happen. So mm -hmm. you'll find that this issue is not just about poo in fish, it's not just about the preservation in Green River, it's about whether the earth is old or whether the earth is young and whether the Bible is historically accurate. Uh, I'm sure you notice how many valves were present. Glenn, you said you've been there and done some digging. Did you mm -hmm. see all those millions of valves? Millions, <laughs> yes. It's yeah, almost, it's almost drives you crazy, doesn't it? The absolute yeah. number of valves there, particularly in that 18 inch band half a metre band representing supposedly 40,000 years. Um, <laughs> now, at that basis, this much rock is not going to have any fossils in it. As I love to say, slow fossils means no fossils, right? Because the various processes would just disintegrate the fish just as rapidly as they disintegrate the fossilised uh, faeces. Diane, any comments from you on that or do we pass on to the next one? Well, I'm a fish farmer here, so I've got a comment. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, I've seen I've seen lots of fish poo in my t my time, and um, it, a little bit like us, I think the the poo is some somewhat dependent on what they're eating, but um, they're they're very fragile. Uh, that falls apart very quickly, and there's no question at all that it has to be rapid burial. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, Craig. If that's an authoritative verse, I've seen is millions of fishes sometimes, particularly the uh, seahorses and things like that. So very authoritative there, Craig. Oh, well, my job was uh, seahorse poo cleaner for quite a while there. so <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't come more highly qualified. All right, Sam, any other questions? Uh, yes, we've got another one here from Free Speech Matters comes in and says, uh, if we entertain the idea of dragon legends depicting real dinosaurs, could we say the same thing for legends of giants that appear in nearly every place around the world and even in the Bible? Okay, we'll split that into two. Uh, if we're asking, could the dragon legends indicate real dinosaurs, I think this is a conclusion that's valid, that um, since all legends seem to be have some basis in fact. Legends are like gossip. Uh, there's virtually no legend that I know of just originates as a totally fictional. Uh, whilst we can make up fiction and you've only got to go to court and listen to the lawyers for the defence if you want to hear us making up fiction. But the fiction turns out to be a better way of rearranging the actual evidence, right? So that you're trying to tell a story which will make the jury think one way using the same set of evidence that the defence for the, the opposition is trying to show the client is innocent or guilty or whatever. Uh, so legends always have that 
distinct connection more or less back to the fact. So I have no problem seeing legends as the consequence of truth, not necessarily the truth themselves. Joe, have you got any comment on that there? Yeah, it's also worth seeing whether or not the legends have any um, particular connection to um, real artifacts and stuff like that. So, for instance, we don't just have the stories of the dragons. We also have the depictions of yes. the dragons in the carvings, in the drawings, yes. and so on and so forth. So that gives you one extra step of evidence because we're not purely dealing with something that is just a story. Uh, when you have independent accounts of stories, that's an excellent piece of evidence on its own. When you have independent accounts of stories and independent depiction of these creatures, and they all depict a reptilian-like, dinosaur-like creature, um, then that's one step further. When it comes to giants, you need to be slightly more uh, careful. I do not think that the, the, the legends of giants or the depictions of giants are as prevalent or as strong uh, as is dinosaurs. But you do also mention the fact that you have the Bible there. Yes. Now, we start with the Bible, and we do have depictions of giants. Now, of course, giant is a subjective word. It's also a pagan word, as I'm sure John uh, can go on to and explain. So we need to be even more careful when we're taking a pagan word and trying to use it to explain something that's given in the Bible. What is in the Bible is lots and lots and lots of uh, information about the giants around the time of the book of Numbers and the conquest of Canaan. And we have some good indication of their size. So that should really be where we start beyond any kind of legend or story. We should start with scripture and work our way outwards from there. Um, John? Okay, I'll give you my personal example because having looked for some of these historic records of monsters, dragons, call them what you will. Um, remember, dragon was the official word for dinosaur uh, before and after the word dinosaur was invented. That is easy to establish. So it doesn't start as a legend, right? It seems to have legendized only after the demise of the dragons. So you find the death of the last dragons in Scotland reported even in the first printing presses, right? So it was such a, a fresh memory of people killing off the dragons, which it also includes by this day had come so small. Here in Australia, we have one written record, which I actually came across in a coroner's report of the death of the first white man up on the Darling Downs. Now, way less in history, just sort of nearly 200 years ago at the most, Australia doesn't have elongate European histories compared to <laughs> other countries. But the Europeans had come in through uh, an inland town because our coast wasn't accessible uh, as easy as it is today. And they traveled through the, the um, uh, highlands up there, down through places like what are now Warwick, which is really our oldest town. Brisbane as a town comes later. It was just a, a penal colony, a prison place. And while they were up there, they actually were getting on very well with the local native inhabitants, the Aborigines. And on record in the, is the death of the first white man written for the coroner that he was told by the natives he was down having a swim in the pool and the native chieftain came along and said, get out, get out, the monster's coming. Right, and then it goes on and says, "Thus, this was the first white death recorded here. The monster got it, right? And it's described as having a big long neck, a mouth, a, a head like a horse with big teeth, and it got him. Um, and so, yes, we have stories of monsters up till recently. Now, dragon is not used; it's not an Aboriginal word. Uh, by that time, it was still uh, in the iffy stage in English." Uh, but monster is definitely a word that's continued uh, on uh, here in Australia as well. Having been up to that area, look through the spooky jungles. Yes, we still have a lot of unpopulated place in Australia. Uh, that area is spooky. Come with me sometime if you want to do some decent mountain climbing and, and jungle bashing. That area is spooky, scary, uh, and uh, yeah, pretty dangerous as well. But that's the sort of thing you've got in Australia but the event gave rise to the actual story and not, not the story giving rise to believing in the event, right? And the question implies that the stories in the Bible 
are the result of legends. No, the legends are the result of the facts in the biblical record and the facts in ancient Me uh, Mesopotamia giving rise to the actual legends later on. That's certainly the case in Scotland, my home uh, country, where the death of the last dragons precedes the coming of the mythical type stories of them. Anybody else got any comment on that before we pass on? I would just add that some of the historians that we accept what they recorded, such as Marco Polo, who talked about dragons in, in China. Alexander the Great talked about the dragons um, killing his elephants that he was using. And, and I find it interesting, even places that were remote from all of Europe, North America and South America, there are depictions drawn, petroglyphs, uh, very detailed uh, dinosaurs. So, uh, and they have their legends that they've passed on as well. So, that part is definitely right. Um, the Bible, you've got many references to the giants. It's well accepted they were giants. I think the question is about the, these giants in the Bible. They record what their height was, and it was yeah. you know basically around ten feet. But the legends are that there's giants that were 20 and 30 feet tall, and that's where it's, you know. Even up to 120 feet tall in some, in, or 150 foot tall in some records, and that they managed to hang on to the back of the ark to survive and all sorts of stuff. So <laughs> yeah, you you kind of move going. into the realm of complete fiction very quickly. Yes. Um, but that's why we need to start with scripture, which it does give us yes. lots of detailed records about, like you said, the height of these. And, you know, the the, the height is around, like you say, the 10 foot tall mark. Um, yes. The largest dimensions recorded for human was King Og. And we don't get told how big he was. We get told how big his bed was. So if you assume that his bed yep. was bigger than he was, which is a, a, a reasonable assumption, you still get around the 10, uh, 9 to 10 yes. feet tall. All, which um, I'm sure Diane can comment on the, the limits of human size, uh, and that is about where it's at. I'd like to so, add to that we don't have the the pictures that you have of, of the dinosaurs, uh, with the exception of um, some of the Egyptian pictures, and the few that they have of that show them they would be in the 10-foot range, not, mm -hmm. not these 30 feet that you mm -hmm. hear and read about in. One, one of the books, by the way, which should be available from some of our offices is by Vance Nelson, yes. dealing with these mm -hmm. dragons. And that is superb. The research mm -hmm. Vance has done is to be credited with. And if you want to check the mythological side of it, the evidence side of it, uh, the biblical side of it, Vance always does a, a great job of research. So we've got copies out here. Um, I think there have you got any in the UK, Joe? Uh, of the dragons, we do, yes, and you have both the dragons and the flood ones in the USA as well. Yeah, so, oh, that's, yeah. Good. that's good. So they can be ordered. Can people order books through your new USA website? Not as of yet, that's but true. very soon you will see that there will be links to the David Reeves Creation yeah. Superstore, which is where mm -hmm. you'll be able to get all of Creation Research's content very shortly. But they can make donations to the UK. Uh, to USA. Yes. yes. On okay, that new so website, creationresearchusa.org, creationresearchusa.org, you'll be able to make donations which go straight through to Creation Research and help support us in all that we do. Okay, Sam, I don't think there's any other questions there, is there? No, no, no more questions, but do keep them coming because um, we'll have another Q&A section later on. And if you put uh, that website, the new U U USA website up, that'll be a great help. Remember, if you're interested in ministry for Joe, let Glenn t uh, know. And uh, likewise, if you want more information on our museum opening 29th and 30th, uh, that is on our current Australia website. So you can put that link up as well. Okay, to our main topic, let me get some crossbones. Let me get a unusual skull here. All right. Now, that's not the way you normally see it, is it, Sam? You, you are giving us a hey-ho, my hearties. Um, no, my laddie, no. <laughs> all right there. All right. Uh, it actually sounds like someone from Norfolk when you do that, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, okay. Now, of course, that became well-known as the sign of the, the pirates, which meant death wasn't far away. 
and I'll finish off by its common use uh, on gravestones uh, up until a certain date in English history. And you don't actually put that on your on your gravestone anymore. And there's a connection here. Now, Diane, uh, as our uh, chief head resident, medical one, can, can you recognize this fossil? Well, that's that's another one of the uh, Australopithecine fossils. Okay. Um, in fact, if you wanted to call it by its current name, let me show you its uh, its ancestor. There we are. That that's that's the Australopithecus fossil. Whereas I was tricking people, this is actually just simply an ordinary chimpanzee type creature in the same sort of family. So, Joe, mm -hmm. now you're the fossil man. Um, what's this one? Come on, you've got yeah, a bit of this in mind. Are you going to get yeah. the skulls up? Is that, shall I get, uh, let's get the skulls out and pull yeah, down. that's and the show. way to do it. Actually, let's, let's switch the cross across, Sam, to the, yeah. uh, to the other camera that's again. That's good. There we are. Right, so I'll get rid of these now. And we'll pull in some of our skulls. So we start off with this one. This is the, uh, the, the famous Lucy one there, John. Now, Joe, I was uh, in Canada when they found that, and uh, I yes. still remember um, Dr. Johansson on screen explaining to a guy who was interviewing because he became so famous almost overnight um, when, when the guy said to him, now, what are these actual dark marks? And he said... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. He said, they're the parts that we actually found. Now, that was... <laughs> That was the end of the interview, right? The guy just yeah. burst out laughing because he thought the rest of the skull was what had been found and the few minor dark marks were just filled in. It was really filled in, worse. no. It's the other way around. In fact, look at this, right, because this is the Australia Pithecus Afensis, right, the, the famous Lucy, and we spoke about this with the around the museum with Joe and Diane, so go and check that out. Um, but if you actually have a look at it, so there's all the dark marks, right? That's the bit that they found. But notice that they, there are no dark marks around the upper jaw, right, around those teeth. Now, it's interesting because they've actually given her a human jawbone, a human jaw there. The top palate of the jaw, it's, it's stereotypically classically human. And yet none of the other parts of the bones that have been found, none of the other parts of the skeleton give any indication that it's a human skeleton at all. It is very clearly and obviously an ape skeleton, yet the bits that they haven't found, they've kind of, well, doctored is perhaps the best word, faked. Um, you know, it's definitely been changed uh, and depicted as a much more human kind of fossil despite not actually finding any of those parts so um it's 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 rather interesting the length that some people will go okay so joe you've got a lot more skeletons there so bring up each one and and comment on and then diane and i and craig so yeah, so this one is the um, the famous Hobbit, um, not the, uh, the the Tolkien Hobbits, although I suspect that's where it was named after. But this was found uh, a little while back. This is perhaps the most recent of all of the discoveries. Um, the skull has been slightly blown up out of proportion, but it's relatively accurate in terms of shape. And uh, we've written a lot about this on creation research, especially on the Astron Mackay site about the Hobbit and whether or not it's a human or an ape or so on and so forth. Um, so there's one of those skulls. We've then got a couple of Neanderthal type skulls. Um, so again, this is a partial skull. This is an exact replica, so it's quite a nice detail. Uh, you can see some of the teeth down the bottom there. You can see some of the brain cavity around there as well. Um, but there's the Neanderthal, big brow ridges, um, does have a nose which is interesting because you'll actually notice on both the hobbit if we put it on sideways like that and you'll also notice on lucy as well um there's no nose ridge so neither of those creatures could wear glasses whereas neanderthal could wear glasses quite nicely and then we also have our complete uh, almost complete neanderthal skull one of the most complete neanderthal skulls found and you can just kind of see the difference here right you see the dark patches 
The dark patches are the bits that are missing. <laughs> Unlike Lucy, where the dark patches are the bits that have actually been found, um, the, <laughs> the very patches that are on this skull are actually the bits that are missing. The rest of this was actually what was discovered. So you can see the complete beautiful um, cranial space in there as well, which we can do cranial testing for sure, and uh, a jaw as well as you can see. Again, classically human, even with the big brow ridges, you have got the nose ridge there. And then finally, we've got our human skull, uh, which you can see here. So this is a what you could call modern human, um, at least 100 years old. We know that because it uh, has to be over 100 years old to legally have it here in the UK. But it's uh, your classical human skull. In fact, we can go one step further. Let me just uh, change around some of the lighting here uh, because we're going to grab the camera now very quickly and we're just going to uh, move it slightly round if we can do that there we go to our complete human skeleton that we have over here now this is ezekiel ezekiel is a complete human skeleton he's uh, actually a medical specimen which we were able to acquire so we've got him perfectly legally uh, he came from an old medical university and you can see he is the complete deal he has got the complete skeleton there with him uh, where he's mounted and in fact Diane, i'm actually looking forward to the next time that um you come over here to the uh, UK because I think we did about two episodes of Around the Museum with Joe and Diane uh, on human skeletons and stuff like that. But it'll be absolutely brilliant if we can actually do a whole series of programs uh, on human anatomy and the human skeleton and everything like that mm. with Ezekiel here because he is so brilliantly put together again. He's the complete human skeleton from the same individual, which is great. He's a male. Uh, you know he's a male because you know there's no way in the world that you're pushing a baby through that pelvis. So we're definitely dealing with a male for sure. And uh, he's a really, really nice example of a human skeleton full of beautiful design. But that's for uh, another episode later. So, John, back to you. And if you want any of the skulls that I've got shown up on screen, just shout. Okay, will do. Okay, now the next little bit will sort of be between me and Diane and Craig. Uh, Diane, just a test here, and Craig, this is uh, your um, Australopithecus um, boisei, uh, and it's it's a beautiful specimen, even though it's sort of made of fiberglass. Uh, it reminds me of an actual human skeleton that uh, I, I have, which was beautifully made up, uh, the precursor to this one, and I had it stolen. Now, I don't know if you've ever had to make insurance claims on a stolen skeleton, but I've been assured by the insurance company it's not all that common. Yes, even though we will be taking out insurance policies on all the fossils that have been transferred to the museum. Oh, what a nightmare. It reminds me of the last ones. Um, you see, we had to get the police in on it, verify it was stolen, all of those things. And then the insurance company rang us up and said, um, could we come and see you, sir? We've never had a claim on a skeleton before. And so he came and he inspected all of our bones and all of these things. We were genuine collectors. And then he said, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Uh, I said, no. He said, go right ahead. Uh, I said, go right ahead. And he asked me questions like, now, this skeleton, is it new or secondhand? <laughs> 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 and I thought, how do I answer that? Uh, and I, and I, I said, well, I'd have to say secondhand, used once by a dear old lady in India. Uh, that's all I could say. And the rest of the, the interview questions were, were just hilarious. Uh, and no, we never got the skeleton back. Uh, so moral of the story is don't get your skeleton stolen in the first place. So if you're coming to our open day and seeing some of our fossils and skeletons, please don't take them. Insurance assessors have no real way of dealing with a claim on a skeleton. Now, Craig, back to you and back to Diane. Now, Craig, this is Nutcracker Man, otherwise an Australopithecine, a very, very coarse one. Um, which country in the world is famous for these uh, Australopithecus. Craig, do you remember? Uh, well, I know Mary Leakey found this, the original one of this, but was it Ethiopia? Yeah. 
you, you've got these in in eastern Africa um, and all the way through Lake Turkana and places like that. And the leakies have been associated with many of these fossils for quite a long time. And usually, don't mean to sound sarcastic, but they release their new finds or they used to release their new finds just before the grants were, were promoted. Yep, good policy, good PR, but that's how it was done. Now, Diane, uh, how would you characterize this as you definitely know it's not a human skull? What would you as the medical biologist tell us? No, th th this is an example of an australopithecine again, but uh, there are two groups of australopithecines and one group uh, which includes that one you're holding up are called robust australopithecines, which means big and tough. And uh, they were uh, apes. The term australopithecus does not mean ape man. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, australopithecus, they are often portrayed in the popular literature as so-called human ancestors, uh, but austral means just southern. It doesn't specifically refer to Australia. Pithecus means ape. And the reason these are called robust australopithecines is because, well, for a start, they are big and chunky, but also they have that very distinctive crest on the top of the head, um, which is a muscle attachment site and also the enormous jaw um, and you can see the angle of the jaw there, really big. You've got a large surface area for very big uh, muscles, so very big chewing muscles. And that's where the term nutcracker man came from. People looked at this thing and thought, well, he must have eaten lots of really tough food and his jaws acted like a big nutcracker and he could just um, uh, crack and crunch on anything that was big and tough, including things like shellfish, not, not necessarily just nuts. Uh, so robust australopithecines uh, just means big, tough, ape-like creatures. Uh, they yeah. are extinct now, but they are distinctively apes. Now, you've got another type of australopithecine mm -hmm. there. These are what are called the gracile australopithecines or gracious or more fine-boned ones. So these are smaller creatures. They don't have that big sagittal crest, but they still have big jaws in comparison to the heart size of the whole brain or of the whole head. And you can see quite a small brain case. So again, these are fully ape. There's no uh, evidence that these are human ancestors. They are simply dead apes or extinct apes. And we shouldn't be surprised about that. There are lots of extinct other types of animals. So why shouldn't there be extinct apes? Apes live in Africa. These days, finding extinct apes in Africa should be no surprise to anybody. It's only because they want to tell a story about humans evolving from apes that we have these connections which are made in the popular literature but not found in the actual evidence. Diane, these pygmy mm. chimp type present day ones, um, yes. what, what's the connection between their brain capacity and the Australopithecus brain capacity? What, what sort of space brain wise do these creatures characteristically have, whether they've got big robust jaws or uh, they're extinct or uh, like the pygmies, uh, pygmy chimps, they're basically mm. still here. How does that differ, say, from us in a present-day skull, uh, which is this one here? How, how does that? How, how do we compare with those skulls of claimed ancestors? Uh, well, the, the first one you were holding up there, um, that uh, that's a, a modern chimpanzee, uh, which has a brain size. Uh, yes, that's about four hundred and fifty uh, cubic centimeters, uh, which is a th about a third of uh, a modern day human skull. So the Australopithecines, a third to a half the size of uh, a modern human um, brain size. And you've, you've got to look at the overall proportions of it as well as the cranial capacity. But there is a big difference between the cranial capacity or how much brain space you've got uh, from a chimpanzee to a human being, and the australopithecines are definitely down there in the chimpanzee range, in the ape range. 
uh, okay, not in the human back range. Back to me yes. again, mm -hmm. because here's one that Joseph held up, and uh, it is a, a great um, copy, mm -hmm. obviously, of of the uh, Neanderthal man, the classic find. But uh, Diane, I'm going to hold up the other one in our collection, which is mm -hmm. Cro Magnon as well, because you did some superb work on uh, the brain capacity because with these creatures you hold them up you've got a hole I've, I've got too many heads here you've got a hole in the base and you can actually pour liquid in and in your medically accurate ones the more expensive casts you can actually get the volume of the brain capacity so diane talk about these because the most interesting thing emerges between the monkeys and chimpanzees and that and historically the skulls of Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, and us. Yeah, well, Cro-Magnon uh, is, is quite a famous name. It's not an official scientific uh, taxonomic label. Uh, it just refers to the fact that these were the original cavemen. So Cro-Magnon just means big cave. Uh, and these are classified as archaic human beings. They are recognised as being fully human and they are large uh, as well as being found in a large cave. And uh, if, you, uh, if you go back to John, can you hold that one up, the Cro-Magnon? Uh, yeah, there yes. Is. See how, right, it's got a big round head and it is actually larger than the current average for modern humans. So this is fully human. It's got all of the um, human characteristics of, of, a, of a cranium and, uh, and a full skull there. And it has a cranial capacity of anywhere up to about 1800 cc's. There are a number of these found. That's not the, not the only one. Uh, so these are classified as Homo sapiens, which is the name for modern man. Uh, and there's no, no um, dispute about that these days. But the interesting thing is that the average brain size was was larger significantly uh, than the uh, the modern human one. Now, if you hold up the uh, the, the Neanderthal, um, I'll just make one comment while I do because I must give credit to Joseph. He's the first person I've heard use the nose ridge as evidence they could have worn glasses. So thank you for that, Joe. Let's uh, put this one up here the uh, Neanderthal one, and I'll comment after you, Diane, because I've been mm. to where they found these and checked the latest things out in the Neander Valley. Yes, Neanderthal is not a term that means primitive. It's actually derived from the place they were found. So it's, it's a location. Uh, now, it is an odd sort of shape in terms of it is elongated from front to back and you have this distinctive brow ridges. But if you measure the cranial capacity, and we can do this very accurately now, uh, not by filling it up with liquid, <laughs> um, but by actually taking 3D scans these days. But the original uh, research was done by filling them up with liquid. If you do that, you end up with a larger brain size than the modern day average as well. Not as big as the Cro-Magnon, but certainly larger than the, by, by a couple of hundred centi uh, cubic centimetres than the uh, modern day average. Um, so uh, up to about 1400, um, whereas the modern day average could be round about uh, 12, 1250. Um, there, there's quite a, quite a big range, but certainly not down to the chimpanzee size, uh, uh, over a thousand for the uh, okay. for, for modern day humans. So... so what we've got in the so-called archaic human beings and Neanderthal man, remember that doesn't mean primitive, it just refers to a place. So these so-called archaic human beings had bigger brains than the modern human living ones who are walking around the world today and thinking that they are so smart. Okay, let me comment here because in reality what you've just said is the brain size in human skulls based on the fossils that we've got of people. And remember, these fossils are mostly coming from caves, right, or superficial deposits. Mm. So they are all technically post-flood type fossils with few exceptions. Big, lesser, and least. Now, in other words, you and I need a computer to work with because the one on the inside is running out, right? 
Now, catch that. It's important and it's humbling. But we used to be able to calculate things like building Noah's Ark, the amount of timber needed in here. Now we need a, a laptop with 200 gigabytes memory, uh, et cetera, to actually do the same calculations. So the history is good to bad to worse. We are not evolving upwards from apes. And the point that needs to be made, particularly for any of you Christians who are thinking God could have used evolution, you have insulted the integrity of the most high righteous God who says, I always tell you the truth. I was there. I made Adam in my image. And don't be surprised. He was so smart. Even his kids invented metal technology within one generation of Adam being on the planet and not just digging up metals, but making metal alloys a thousand years at least before Noah's Ark. So you may want to know, why did Noah build an ark out of wood when they already had metal technology? Well, that's another subject for another day. But I said I was going to comment on Neanderthal Valley. One of my tasks has been to make sure I get to all of these famous places and do my own investigation, my own photography. So I went to Neander Valley. And in fact, Neanderthal means Neander's Valley in old German. Neander is a person's name. Tal as in Dale, as in Dale, as in Vale, as in Valley, right? So Neander's Valley is Neanderthal. It had that name before they found a skull in a cave which took the name of the valley. How did it get its name? Joachim Neander was a poet who lived in nearby Dusseldorf and he went to this little valley to write his poetry, the most famous of which is praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. So even the words we use betray the history of the people. Neanderthal man is named after a godly Christian, very famous hymn writer. But you go there today and they no longer have Darwin's lie. What do I mean by Darwin's lie? They have the ape-like creature turning into man, getting bigger and bigger brains and less hair. Now, what they have is a very significant person who's tall, that's their models, and he's blue-eyed and he's got Germanic-type blonde red hair. Ah, and he's got sophisticated weapons. So what you find is the whole picture of Neanderthal based on the evidence is of a person on the up? Sorry, no, he's already losing brain capacity and you and I uh, have even less capacity than a Neanderthal and those prominent brow ridges? Well, a lot of them seem to turn out to be vitamin D deficient. Why? Because at the Neanderthal Museum, they have Neander, a Neanderthal man hunting mammoths in the icy snow. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. When you live in icy snow, vitamin D deficiency is usually a problem, particularly if you have nice rosy brown skin in the cold. So you'll find that Neanderthal seem to suffer in the original regions from a vitamin D deficiency. And as Diane will tell us, vitamin D is one of the key factors that associates where calcium is deposited on your bones. And as one researcher I looked up said, we saw the same effect on soft bone syndrome happening around Liverpool and in England as the smoke covered the skies. The bones went soft and bone deformities became very prominent, particularly in the ever expanding skull region of the child. Now, Diane, uh, before we um, sort of begin to round up the program, move on to questions again, Tell us about skull shape in children and the evidence for design in the way the skull actually forms. It will help a lot of people out there realize that skulls are very susceptible to, uh, well, I guess you could say vitamin D deformities. Well, uh, skulls are not actually one bone. Your cranium, your, your brain um, cavity is not just one bone. It's actually made up of several bones so that uh, when you're born, uh, those are actually separate from one another because there has to be room for the brain to grow and for the whole head to grow, of course. 
And so the separate bones are um, distinct from one another. They are connected by a layer of fibrous tissue, which will protect the, ba uh, the brain. But um, uh, uh, any of you, of course, who have ever held uh, a, a newborn baby or a relatively young baby will know that it has soft spots in its head. Uh, and that is where the bones are connected by just fibrous tissue to give them room to grow. So when you're born, your um, cranial bones are separate from one another. You've got space for them to grow. Now, eventually, the fibrous tissue is replaced by bony tissue and the bones join up. But you can still see where the joins are um, in, in the bones. And you can see this better in a real skeleton than in, that, than in a cast. You actually see some uh, very, very fine wriggly lines. Uh, where the bones have, have joined up, but not completely um, ossified or completely become bone across that. So you're born with room to grow, the bones will grow into that fibrous tissue and then eventually become uh, a very solid and, uh, and robust structure uh, to protect your bone, uh, to protect your brain. And so that's why we can measure the brain capacity in skulls before we had the 3D scanning technique uh, by filling them up with with uh, liquid and, and measuring the volume, but but now we could you can measure the the uh, brain volume of living bone of living heads or living people uh, uh, using the um, uh, CT scanning that we have these days. Uh, so you, just, can... you don't have to take your head off anymore, uh, Diane. You did a, a marvelous item that we posted online. Uh, about brain mm. volume, comparing Neanderthal, uh, mm. Cro-Magnon, modern humans, etc. Um, tell us a bit about that uh, and where they can find it, if you remember. Uh, we, we've done it in several of our slideshows, and we will uh, we will set it up in our new museum to show that uh, rather than um, ever expanding brains, uh, uh, the humanity is actually undergoing a brain drain. And so we've gone from the, the caveman, and cavemen are usually presented as sort of being brutish idiots that, uh, you know, went around going, og, uh, and uh, going out and hunting mammoths and uh, with clubs. And uh, although you've got to be smart to actually hunt mammoths. Um, but, uh, but yes, the, the whole um, picture of the um, half-intelligent ape man uh, living in a cave, uh, turning his grunts into grammar does not work in in terms of just what we know about the sheer brain size that uh, so-called archaic human beings had bigger brains and we're going downhill. So we're undergoing a brain drain, I'm afraid. And we'll, and, we'll have that on display at, at our museum. The thing, the thing that really yep. jumps out with me, to me with this whole thing is the weight of evidence in, in the last few decades has just blown away the lies that were told in the 1960s and 1970s. So yeah. if, you, if you were learning about this subject back back in those days, you were just completely mm. lied to with regard to these things being sort of uh, steps in the evolutionary process of, of mankind. Uh, and, and when we went to the Answers in Genesis Museum in Kentucky, not the, the ARC one, the, the original one, I think that's one of their best displays is the Australopithecus display where yeah. they've got the right. actual um, bones at, to the right mm. scale overlaid in front of a model basically of a chimpanzee and showing how it can fit mm. exactly to a, a hairy uh, chimpanzee-like animal, which is fully recognised now in, this, in the secular science as well. Okay, before yes, we <clears throat> and it's not just the um, the the brain size and the brain shape, um, uh, as we said earlier in when you were looking at the skulls about the jaw, the Australopithecine jaw is actually a distinct V shape. Uh, it's not that um, parabola shape, mm. which is the uh, human shape. That's been added in. Well, well it's accepted as a knuckle walking tree dweller. Yes. Isn't yeah. it? Oh, yes. yes. There's, there's plenty more evidence. In term, when you go to the postcranial skeleton, in other words, the the rest of the body, uh, you've got to look at the body proportions uh, as and the uh, shapes of the individual bones. 
and the more research we do, the more uh, more ape-like they turn out to be. Okay. And it turns out that their uh, scans of the leg bone show that uh, Lucy died falling out of a tree. She was yes, a... yes, we and we've got a report about that in, in the fact file. So mm -hmm. yes, if you you go to our fact file and look up uh, Lucy or look up Australopithecines, you'll find a number of these studies. And uh, they don't get much publicity, but they are there in the professional literature and they are reported in the uh, science news services. So we pick these up and uh, put them together. Uh, so, okay. yes. Do have Diane, a last question, mm. which I've been trying to get in for a while. Sorry, Sorry. about that. But uh, we want to get on to the uh, final couple of questions that have come in mm. and make a point to give people something to take away spiritually, historically, etc. The where would they find the measurements and the, the liquids, et cetera, and volumes? What's it under on our fact file or Q&A site? What do they go looking for? Uh, it's actually not in either of those. but uh, Oh, it isn't? Okay. No, no it's not. not. We, we've done it a number of times in our own, in our own slideshows. Um, okay. So yeah. raise your right hand and promise me it will be there as soon as we can possibly get it up. Or alternatively, come to our Creation Discovery Centre yes. opening on the 29th and 30th, and you will see the setup uh, that we've used. Mm. And I'm really glad to say we can do it with CT scans nowadays. Uh, we won't have a CT scanner there, so we can't give you a brain volumetric readout on the day. Um, I guess that'd be a good attraction sometimes, wouldn't it? But anyway, be well, that I as think some people might be disappointed. <laughs> thinking that they'd have bigger brains than they really have. <laughs> yeah, truth would hurt. Let, let me make a closing comment here before we take the last couple of questions. Remember how we started with our nice little uh, um, little picture here of the skull and crossbones? I better straighten up our chimpanzee skull. You never see it portrayed with a chimp skull, but you do see it portrayed with a human skull. And to most people, the skull and crossbones represents the uh, watch out I'm a pirate sort of line and you are going to be killed but where we see this dominantly in history is on gravestones uh, how do I know that I've made it my business to photograph gravestones all around the planet ancient Roman gravestones uh, all sorts of gravestones because I was interested in the lie that we are living longer Number one, you can easily prove it's false from the gravestones. We are living less time on average than we ever did. Uh, they used to live a lot longer, even in England. The Industrial Revolution comes along and the average drops, but the extreme still is usually greater than what we find today, and that continues on with a few little interruptions there. But what you notice is around about the late 1500s, early 1600s, the skull and crossbones disappears from the gravestones. And you want to know why? Medieval, superstitious, Catholicism, you know, that was really tied in to secular religion was still dominating European thought. What hope did you have? I mean, if you had to pay the priest to get a burial and get years off purgatory, it wasn't much to look forward to. And then the Reformation came, and the truth is the ex-Catholic scholar Martin Luther, who actually had struggled up the stairs in Rome seeking forgiveness and penance and all of that, actually discovered the truth of the biblical message, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of Christ who has done all the work for you. What a revelation that salvation was free. There was nobody who was between you and this Christ, and you want to know why the cross and crossbones and, and the skulls disappeared off the graves? What you find replacing them, look at Charles Wesley's, John Wesley's tombstones. They're on the, the, the actual footpath outside his building in London there. And what a joy, what a delight when you know that you are going to be absent the body and present with the Lord. What a joy when you have that certainty that it's not through the lie of evolution where you're ascending higher and higher, but you still haven't made it to eternal life and never will. 
What a joy when you discover that Jesus did all the work to pay for Adam's sin. That's why Adam matters. So you theologians, don't call God a liar by making Adam some sort of overbrained ape. And that's why Jesus is called the last Adam. He actually paid for the sin of the first Adam. And we, as all of Adam's descendants, actually have been afflicted by that problem of sin. So only Jesus Christ, the last Adam, the perfect Adam, could die to pay the penalty for sin. Now, that's why the skull and crossbones disappeared. So can I challenge you, if you don't know this Christ as your Lord and Saviour, now's the time. Otherwise, all you have is the skull and crossbones, the sadness of knowing that you're going to die and you may not know what's coming after. Well, the same Jesus Christ warns us about both hell and eternity in the flames as a reality. <clears throat> don't, don't take my word for it read what he has to say he's gone to all the trouble of revealing it through his word sam any more thank yous any more uh, uh questions right okay uh we have let's just take uh ezekiel off the screen there there we go that's that's uh that's much better for my uh ocd um so um uh we've got uh one question here we don't have to thank you oh no actually we've got two questions uh so this one comes in from box elder uh, is there any evidence that supports greater oxygen levels in the atmosphere in the past being necessary for the large dinosaurs and large dragonflies to achieve their size? Okay, well, the fact that you've got large dinosaurs and dragonflies is it's in itself an indication of higher oxygen levels. Um, you can test this by very simply adding modern day creatures like dragonflies and the like into artificial environments where you have higher concentrations of carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and higher concentrations of oxygen um, put those two together not only do you get a denser atmosphere you also get a healthier atmosphere where bugs will actually grow larger now it's not the sole source of large bug size because genetics is also going to come into play mm -hmm. and this whole idea of good to bad to worse as it's documented in scripture okay. of creatures going downhill as well as the um, um, sort of downhill spiral of climate as well. But you can also find there are secular reports uh, on amber, Cretaceous amber, where they've taken uh, um, uh, samples of uh, Cretaceous air and tested the concentrations of carbon dioxide and, uh, and oxygen in there. And you, yes, you have higher percentages of both of those things. Um, so it's uh, not the case. It's basically the case that your majority of your gas in your atmosphere today is nitrogen. Uh, it's uh, around sort of 20 to 30 percent oxygen. So higher concentrations of oxygen, higher concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, means more plants. More plants means healthier atmosphere. So all of these things put together, plus with uh, other pieces of evidence, like you go along the Jurassic and the Cretaceous all the way down to the Carboniferous, the vast amount of plant life tells you that there's going to be higher oxygen levels just because there's more plant levels, right? And in order to sustain that level of plant material that we find in the fossil record, you're going to need higher uh, carbon dioxide levels. Um, things like dinosaurs, like the great big flying reptiles, just simply would not be able to fly or survive in the atmosphere that we have today you would need a denser atmosphere so more and more of these pieces of indication come together to show you that greater oxygen levels greater carbon dioxide levels mean a healthier atmosphere a better atmosphere and an atmosphere which is able to sustain the type of life and the amount of life that we see in the fossil record plus um, the, what probably, you're talking about is going to really impact the carbon dating because you're going to have Absolutely. much less nitrogen being converted to C14. You've got much more C12, which is diluting that ratio. So, yeah, yeah for sure. It goes into yeah, the, right. that's, that's I'll, add, I'll add one, one factor here, which has made us so critical of the deceitful politics of climate change. Two things. It's why Professor Ian Plymer, who's a big antagonist of creationists, but at the same time, he says, you people on climate change are just ignorant. You you have plenty of evidence in the rocks of higher CO2, whether it's like mm -hmm. Joe said in the amber or many other places, the size of the fossils. But the thing that convinced us is we set up some experiments. We actually got the aquarium, put life in them, plants, etc. And for 
five years, we had aquariums, sealed aquariums, where you had the, the present day atmosphere, just that was it. Then you doubled the CO2, tripled the CO2, quadrupled the CO2, and we got our best results between three and four times the current level of CO2. And I mean, that's, that's the research that, that we've done and recorded year after year, the plants love more CO2. And of course, if they love the CO2, they generate more oxygen. So you've got all of that indirect evidence that the atmosphere would be way better off with more CO2 than what we've got at the present time. And everything we've been able to check all around the planet indicates that that has been the real history of the planet. And of course, as Joe said, that gives you a thicker atmosphere that enables things like pterodactyls to fly better. It enables you to, you to breathe better and live longer. And likewise, the big dinosaurs. It's And away it goes. Anybody else want to comment on that one? Just that uh, government's done a lot of research doing that. Very large scale experiments, increasing the CO2 and showing how it is beneficial to the plant growth. You get more plant growth. Uh, Oak Ridge National Lab here did that type of work for over a decade that I know of. Um, but you also, with global warming, one of some of the research that I did on it, you shift the growing season to earlier. So you extend the growing season. So again, it, it can be beneficial. Yeah. Yes, there's good evidence that the, it's, the warming is actually the cause of the increased uh, carbon dioxide because with, uh, with warmer climate, you get more plant growth. Uh, so it's it's the other way around in uh, in terms for the climate change people. Mm -hmm. uh, that being warmer is actually warmer and higher carbon dioxide is good for plants, and yes. and we see that there there is an overall greening uh, of the world which we uh, which has been documented from various satellite studies. Uh, I, I like Shuggy War's comment: green tree, green tree. The tree, tree, tree. That's really good. Thank you, Shaggy Wolf. Yeah, yeah um, yes. Good, good visual comment there. <laughs> yeah. good, good contribution, Shaggy. Good yeah. contribution yeah. to the discussion. Any other um, thank yous or questions? Uh, because uh, we've got yeah. one more. One more. Uh, this is probably going to be a shorter one. Uh, from Free Speech Matters. Uh, was Charles Darwin an atheist or a theistic evolutionist? Or he claimed that he was uh, an agnostic. Uh, he yes. called himself an agnostic. Um, he uh, he denied being an atheist. Uh, so ba basically, he just backed out and said, "I really don't want to know," uh, because he was confronted with the um, with the problem of a good God and this bad world that he had come up with mm -hmm. with his theory, and he couldn't put the two together. Uh, but he didn't want to go as far as saying that he was an atheist. In his culture, you really, very, very few people would stand up and call themselves atheists in, in 19th century uh, Britain. Especially the elite. Yeah. This is yeah. the height of Victorian hypocrisy, mm -hmm. where everybody is a Christian, mainly because it's the right thing to be. But you do have Queen Victoria on record saying, well, of course, it's not the rich who sin, that's only the poor. So it is a hypocritical Christianity at the very best. But this is the time of turning uh, away. It's the, the tide is turning. And it is the acceptance of evolution in millions of years, which is the first indication that people don't actually believe in the Bible anymore. And it becomes purely a social event rather than actually this is gospel truth. Um, and so increasingly more and more people refer to themselves as agnostics. Uh, theistic evolutionists doesn't really come in till much later. You'll find that actually uh, things like the gap theory uh, and the idea of millions of years and Lucifer's flood and all this kind of stuff comes in really before any kind of theistic evolution comes in. You'll find the first sort of Darwin's bulldog, Thomas Huxley, could be regarded as the first majorly vocal atheist, doesn't want to believe in God. Uh, and after then, you get increasingly more agnostics turn to practical atheists um, as time goes on. Well, don't, theistic evolutionists believe, don't, don't theistic evolutionists believe that Jesus Christ still rose from the dead, whereas I don't think you could claim that for Charles Darwin. 
You certainly no, can't no. We, we've actually got them. some uh, quotes from his own writings in that article that I referred to earlier on. So if you pick that up, uh, we, we've actually traced the, the history because he wrote lots of letters as well as writing books. So we've got a lot of his own writings that express his own right. views. And the one thing to finish this one on, we have it in print. Darwin himself penned a letter <laughs> advising his own son on how to undermine Christianity, mm. right? So he wasn't a neutral agnostic. He was aggressive and anti-Christian. Mm. So despite the Victorian niceties of putting up there as a gentleman of the elite, um, they, along with Queen Victoria, were really antagonistic to the gospel, which says the Queen, Darwin, theologians, you and me are sinners who need to be saved. And that's you and I watching this program today. And only Jesus Christ is eligible to be the saviour because he alone has not sinned. Um, Joe, any final comments? I've got to go shortly. I think that it is time to come and wrap things up. We will be back next week with another topic and we've got some more guests on the line as well. So uh, do pray for the whole team. Do continue to support us. We do very much appreciate your support and your donations. A reminder of things that are coming up in Australia. We've got the Open Day in the museum happening very shortly. Get in touch with uh, those guys there. They will need help. They will need support and you can come and visit uh, the stuff. We've got Craig's Museum down in Tasmania as well. In the USA, I will be back fully kickstarting the ministry. This last couple of months was mostly sorting out the administration, but we're really kickstarting the ministry trip from the beginning of October to about the second or third week of November. So get in touch with Glenn on the new website, creationresearchusa.org, creationresearchusa.org, and you'll be able to find the contact details on there for getting in touch if you'd like to book ministry in the United States. Here in the UK, we do need your help for sure uh, with the museum set up. We need to revamp all of this museum and we'll be having our open day later on in September this year. So uh, do watch out for that as well. But until next time, Goodbye and God bless. Thank you all so much for those of you who have tuned in. Continue to keep us in your prayers. And uh, if you have any other questions throughout the week, get them up in the comments. Goodbye all and God bless. And we will see you very soon. See you later, everyone. See Bye. Bye. I'll see you in two Bye. weeks. BBS next week. Uh, you know. That's right. <laughs> we'll catch you later, folks. See you later. <laughs>